Today we're going to be looking at Ephesians 4, verse 17, right through to 5, verse 2. And my title is, You Can Choose. And you may be wondering why that's my title. You'll find out at the end. So, just to summarize where we're up to in the book so far with Ephesians, it falls into two halves. Part one, which is the first three chapters, very neatly explains the truth and tells us what reality is about. And part two, which is chapters four through six, tells us how we should live by this truth. And we could summarize part one with three things. It's at the end of it, there's a prayer for us to know the power of the Spirit in our inner person, the love of Christ, which is beyond knowledge, and the destiny of being the very dwelling place of God. And those three ideas, power, love, and destiny, are woven throughout the book. So that's what we're up to, and we're into chapter 4 now, and we're going through then into how we live by this truth. And my title is You Can Choose. And first of all, we're going to review from last time, because it was, it was a really foundational message last time. I'm going to review how the body comes to unity. And then we're going to look at Ephesians 4, 4 verse 17 through 25, which is the first half on your sheet. And then 4, 25 to 5, 2, which is about how we respond to that first half. So, <clears throat> last week... Uh, I would say it's a prophetic word from Paul that something spectacular is going to happen in churches and we can be part of it and we can be instrumental in this happening. So to, um, just to, uh, to summarize these verses as we put these together, um, I'm going to give you how last week's verses fit together. Uh, God gave the gifts for the building up of the body until we grow up into unity measured by the fullness of Christ. So this is Jesus, Jesus' character measures what it looks like to be mature. We're no longer children, and then right in the middle of this, this uh, poetic structure that Paul gave us last time is speaking the truth in love. And from that, we become grown up. We reach unity by every part doing its measure. And that corresponds with the measure of the fullness of Christ and every part doing its measure. So we re if the church, if the body of the church wants to, to reach this, this position of, of maturity, every part must do their share according to what Christ has measured out to them. And then it ends up with a, a phrase that echoes the beginning phrase, the body built up in love. And that's a summary, and I'm just going to actually read a few words from the last part of that, which is what brings us into what we're going to be reading now. So I'm going to scroll down. So we're going to look at um, verse um, 15 now. Um, but speaking the truth in love, we should grow up in every way into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body, being joined together and held together by every supporting ligament, from the proper, proper working of the measure of each individual part, produces the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. Now the key thing here is to get this idea in verse 16. The body, that's the church, is joined together and held together by everybody, every single person, every individual part doing their part. When everybody does their part, the body grows and we have this climax that it builds itself up in love. So this beautiful section we looked at last week is, 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 is put in this uh, really beautiful form where everything is balanced. And the, the final truth is we're going to reach this level of maturity. So let's, uh, let's go back and finish my summary. Um, the question that's asked, that's almost never asked, is when is this going to happen? You know, I read lots of commentaries and academic writings on this, and everybody understands the passage, but they never say, well, when is this going to happen? 
And some assume it happened when the New Testament was completed, like 2,000 years ago. Some say, um, well, but is the church mature yet? Of course not. So it can't have happened. But many think it's not fulfilled until Jesus returns. But that doesn't make sense, because what's the, Paul, Paul, what's the point in Paul trying to reason them how to get there? And uh, the only um, writer that I found who could really, really took this question seriously was a guy called Harold Honer. And he said, if the potential of the fully mature church is not for real in the present time, Paul offers, offers a false hope. And so I ended last week by saying that we need to pursue this. As a community of God's people, we need everybody to do their part. And I, call, I said, Let, we want to work on this journey. And so we need all of us together to discuss how we're going to do this, because we all need to be involved in this part, uh, doing their part in getting in this journey. And I, I summarized it by saying, every part of the body, using the measure of gifting they have, how do we do this? How many churches have succeeded and can give us a process to follow? None, none. The, nobody's actually succeeded in doing this. We're all in this together. I can do my part, personally, me, but, but obviously I can't, you know, everybody's needed. And so I challenged us whether we are up for trying. And that's where I left us last week. And it's really important. I've done a more extensive recap because it's a really important foundation to this week because this week he's going to launch into a little bit of an explanation about how we actually can get there. So an um, incredibly important passage that we did last week. Now we're building on it in this week's passage. And so that was, number one, my review of how the, bo how the body comes to unity. And now we're going to look at the meaning of this, this passage that we're going to look at now in uh, Ephesians chapter 4 and verses 17 through 25. So let's, and then we're going to end up by looking at the, the, the next passage. So let's um, go then to looking at this passage that's in front of you. And uh, I'd like to start reading here at verse, verse 17, Ephesians chapter 4. This, therefore, I say, and insist in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles walk in the meaningless of their thinking. And um, the word mean, I've translated that meaningless. It's um, some translations say futility or vanity. It's actually an echo of the word used in the Old Testament in Ecclesiastes, where he says, you know, I've looked at everything. Everything is meaningless. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher, you know. There's nobody's doing anything, and then he discovers where actually God can give true meaning. And so really what he's saying is here that, is that, that life outside of Christ has got no ultimate meaning, They're like no ultimate value. There's nothing that, that ultimately gets you there. And then he gives three words to describe the, the way that uh, non-Christian thinkers, their minds work. First, darkened in their understanding. Second, alienated from the life that comes from God, and I'll explain that in a minute, because of the ignorance that's in them, because of the hardness of their hearts. And the last one is becoming callous. They give themselves over to self-indulgence, doing every kind of impurity and greedy for more. So that's the first statement, verses 17 and 18 and 19. And then he makes a switch in verse 20 to their situation. But you did not learn Christ in this way, given that him you've heard and in him you were taught, since the truth is in Jesus. And that, if you like, co corresponds with the, the first line here. Um, now, I've, you can see I've colored a lot of words in green. What's the common, the common factor in the words I've colored in green there? Can you tell me? Our minds, our thinking, that's right. So this seems to be the issue here, um, the thinking. So is the answer then that um, uh, lack of education is the problem? If everybody really thought clearly and we had proper education, we wouldn't have any sin in the world. Is that what it's saying? No, I can hear some people laughing because obviously that's not the case. So what is it talking about here? When it's talking about our mind, our thinking, our thoughts about the truth. So... 
Uh, I think part of the answer is uh, when it says you do not learn Christ. And um, now this, I, this translation you have in front of you is, is one that I've done from the Greek, and I'm trying to reflect uh, precisely what it's saying, even though it might not be quite as readable at places, I want to really reflect the word order and the significance. And it literally says you did not learn Christ. And that's not the same as saying didn't learn from Christ. It's saying actually you didn't receive, you didn't actually come to know him in this way. And I want to suggest that this understanding here that is teaching about the truth is in Jesus is not just um, an intellectual understanding, but it's receiving an insight from Jesus that some kind of just more than just facts and information. It's an understanding that we sometimes use light, you know, being we were enlightened. And I would say that this is the main problem that we have um, with the with those who are not followers of Jesus, because the idea here is that Jesus is like a source of power. And if you're not plugged into him, if you're not connected to him, then you can't switch the lights on and you're going to, um, you're not going to really understand things clearly. You're not have a clarity of thought. And so there's going to be um, a, a slide into darkness. Now, you might say, well, you know, this is a very extreme definition here in verses 18 and 19 of somebody who, who isn't a Christian. And yeah, of course, there are, there are wonderful people who are not followers of Jesus, but but nevertheless, there's nothing to stop somebody going in this direction. And many in Paul's time had. I mean, if you read classical history, you'll see like some of the stuff happening is so evil and there's nothing, there's nothing to stop this slide down into that direction because of the lack of the power of Christ. And so what he's saying now is contrasting that to Jesus, the truth is in Jesus. So... <clears throat> The key idea um, comes uh, in verse 18. And the key idea comes, sorry, um, uh, in verse 21, that Jesus is, the truth is in Jesus. That is where things change. The truth is in Jesus. Um, so how, so, so uh, what happens then is he explains this in this um, poetic section here in the middle. And I put it in a box and I've shown, we've, I've talked to you more uh, in the past about the, this kind of poetic structure, but I'm not going to repeat myself now. But just to say, simply, it's sym symmetrical. There's a statement and it's mirrored in a, the opposite statement here. And there's a symmetry and you can see line 22 and line 24 match beautifully, opposites of one another. And then often in this kind of structure, Right in the middle is a key idea which changes everything around, and that switches things around. So what's seeing here? He says, to take off the old self belonging to your former behavior, corrupted by deceptive desires. Deceptive desire is an interesting idea. It's the idea that you may think that you want something, but actually that desire is deceptive. Actually, it's something else you want. You might think you have good reasons for doing something. I'm such a good person. I do this. I do this. Um, you know, people give huge amounts to charity, but only if their name is up there on the building they've donated. So, you know, that's a deceptive desire. The deception is, oh, I'm doing this for good, but actually the real desire is because I want my name up there. And that's the kind of deception that's there. And he, and he uses this expression, which literally is like taking clothes off, taking off an old, dirty old coat and putting on something new. And puts on the new self, and then we have created after the likeness of God. And this new one, rather than deceptive desires, we have truthful, pure behavior. And rather than corruption, we have righteousness. So it's like a mirror image of what's happening there. Um, so the reason why a darkened mind stops people obeying God's laws and God's, God's ethical laws is because they can't see actually that those are the best things. They don't have a connection that says, oh no, that is the way to hope, to beauty, to life. 
So what is, the, what is the, the answer then to this problem? Can you tell me from this passage what's the answer to the problem of verses um, 18 through 21? Somebody tell me. That's correct. You've got it. And what is the key in the middle of that? To be renewed by the Spirit. So it is actually the, the, the being born by the Holy Spirit and that connection with him that is, in fact, it's the key idea. Now, I'm going to use the, um, an illustration later on of um, a vacuum cleaner. And the vacuum cleaner, um, if, if you plug it into the wall, then you know, it cleans quite well. But if you're not plugged into the wall, you can have a lot of trouble actually making much use of it. You might do a bit of sweeping with it. And so this is the idea that there's a power that gets plugged in um, that, that enables this power to come and that enables the change of behavior. So um, what's the answer? It's the life of God in us. The life of God in us. So... <clears throat> What I'm going to do now then is to let's let's um, let's go. Actually, we'll, we'll stay on the screen. I think we can stay on the screen. So also in here it says so literally it there when it says the old self, literally in the Greek it actually says the old man, and here the new self it says the new man, and um, what do you think? Who is the new man? Somebody said it. Jesus, yeah. And the old man would be? Adam. Now, what does that mean? Well, obviously, it's a metaphor. It's a picture. You can't take off Adam. But what it means is it's your connection to that that you put on. So by putting on Jesus, it actually means putting on the part of you that is in Jesus' image and taking off the part of you that is in Adam's image. Um, so... Let's see. Um, okay, let me ask you a question then. Um, Adam and his descendants were, giving, were given laws. And these laws can be summarized in the Ten Commandments. And uh, these are laws that apply to all mankind. They apply to the whole creation. Um, what about us now? Do we, do we have laws now if we're Christians? Yeah, we have what Jesus called the law of love, which is we still, you know, you can still, you can't steal and kill and so on just because you're a Christian. But it's it's basically the same the same ethical standards follow. Um, so it's it's yes and no. The same the same God wants the same thing. He wants people to live to live together and not to fight and not to kill each other. So, but there's something changed about the law, and this is going to be the difference that we're going to be focusing on for the rest of this time. So let me switch back then to looking at um, uh, the, the, the questions that I'm going through. So let's um, talk about a DNA. Now I want to try and give you a picture of this taking off the old, putting off the new, and what it means to be connected with Jesus, to know him and using the image of DNA. Now, you know what DNA is, don't you? It's what you get from your parents. It's, your, it's what defines you know, what color hair you've got and how tall you are, and it's what makes you human, your DNA. And uh, our DNA, Adam was created in the image of God, bearing, in some ways, God's likeness. So Adam had some of God's DNA. So, for example, creativity, uh, that sort of thing. But he rebelled and defaced that image. And so his spiritual DNA was damaged by that. He was, Adam was created from dust, and the new creation, we, we carry God's DNA in a living way. So when Jesus said, you, you must, that which is born of flesh is flesh, that which is born of the spirit is spirit, he's talking about receiving DNA from Adam, receiving DNA from the spirit from God. 
And so when somebody is a, becomes a Christian, they are born from above. They have this new life within them. Our uh, the name of our church is New Life Church to kind of reflect how important this is because it's the life of God that's in you and that life is this new creation life. And so it's a DNA that comes from God and we're created in the spirit, not in, in, in 1 Corinthians, it tells us that the new creation is actually in the spirit. The material we're created from is spirit, and this new nature will naturally want to live like its parents. So, so far, it's all very abstract, what I've been saying right now. I've been talking about these co concepts and the old and the new and so on. And what, what Paul does now is beautiful because he suddenly switches from all these abstract ideas to being very, very concrete. And if you look in your sheets, underneath the box, suddenly we switch into a very, very practical part of it. Originally, I was only going to, print to, to preach on what's above that box and the box, um, which is, which is um, up to verse 25. And then I thought, no, I can't stop there because the second half actually explains what it means for this first half. This is what, how you actually do it. This is what it looks like in practice. And so it's so key that we are actually able to do this and we're actually able to go through. So I'm going to go through now and um, we're going to look at these verses. And um, let's, let's just move down to verse 25. So... We're going to spend a few minutes now looking at um, these verses here. Therefore, having put off falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we're members of one another. Now, you'll notice I've, I've highlighted that in orange there. Um, falsehood, angry, steal, corrupting talk, grieve you'll notice that there's kind of an echoes of the Ten Commandments here. What would falsehood, do you remember which commandment falsehood would echo? The Ninth Commandment, not lying, that's right. I can never remember which number's which, but Peter's on, on us here. So what about being angry? Well, Jesus calls being angry, he says, you know, that's actually linked to killing somebody because it's, you know, killing them in your heart. Which would that be? Murder, which is the Sixth Commandment. Uh, what about verse 28, steal? That's the Eighth Commandment. Uh, corrupting talk. Well, um, there's two ways we can take this. Um, I would say probably it's kind of talk about like sexual corruption he's talking about here, and it's a, a, like it's, a, it's um, uh, kind of um, connected with not committing adultery. Later on, by the way, Paul is going to unpack a lot of these and we're going to have a whole section on the, the, the sexual conduct and so on. And we're going to have a whole really unpacking, but this is really summarizing it. Uh, number 30, I tend to think, is actually about um, uh, insulting the name of God, with, you know, taking God's name in vain, uh, which it says, grieve the Holy Spirit of God. And Let's, let's actually go back to, the first, to verse 25 because there's something really good here. So he says, Therefore, having put off falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun down go, go down on your anger. Do not give an opportunity to the devil. Let the stealer steal no longer. Rather, let him labor, doing honest work with his hands, that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Can you see a pattern in these verses? There's three lines to each one. The first line is what you don't do. The second line is what you do. And the third is a motivation. This is, this is really neat. So the old Ten Commandments was just the first line. You know, thou shalt not kill or whatever. Uh, let, so the, let's go on verse 29. Let no corrupting talk leave your mouths, the negative, but only what is good for the building up of the person who needs it, the positive, that it may give grace to those who are here. Now, before we go any further, how does this connect with what he said earlier about, about um, this new person and what he said in the previous passage we did last week about love 
being the new, the new overall thing that changes everything. How does it connect with that? What is the motivation in each of these? It's a motivation from love. Do you see that? So steal, don't steal, but lay with your own hands. So you've got something to share with someone in need. See, a motivation in love. So this is what is key as a difference with the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments, it was, you know, just do this or you're going to perish. Whereas here, you do this because actually, if you connect with love, that's going to motivate you to do it. This, and this is the key here. This is so good because now we can see where the power is coming from to keep these. The power is coming from the connection with Jesus, which is the love that flows into us. And when the love is flowing into us, we won't, we will naturally just want to do this. We won't want to, to tell lies and bring people down. We'll want to bring them up. We won't want to be angry and smash them, but we'll want to, to we'll want to, uh, to, to, to keep things good. And so, and so uh, this is the pattern that goes on. And then it builds up to a climax. Uh, so verse 30 is a similar kind of thing. Um, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God in whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. So that's the future, what you're looking for in the future. And then we have a climax in verse 31 and 32, which is like, which is six bad things and six good things. Actually, uh, I think there's quite six good things, um, four good things. Let all bitterness and rage and anger and shouting and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. So those are the bad things, the things that are against love, and then be high, become kind to one another, tender-hearted, showing grace to one another. Uh, and then the motivation, just as God in Christ showed grace to you. So here it is again. It's Jesus is the power. It's when you receive Jesus' love that empowers you to live the new life. Now, this is so helpful because the, the bit about putting off the old and putting on the new, like, how do you actually do that? Like, this is a picture. This is how you do it. You do it by connecting with Jesus. And as you connect with Jesus and think, how would Jesus behave in this situation? Jesus, allow your love to flow into me then that, the new, will replace the old. You put on the new by connecting with Jesus. That's how you do it. And so going back to my vacuum cleaner, you know, you can struggle as you like to clean something with a vacuum cleaner that's not plugged in. It could be very hard work. You know, you might be able to sweep things into a corner, but it's hard work. Plug the vacuum cleaner in, and it just does it naturally. And that's the image that's here. If you connect to Jesus, the power will flow, and the new life will flow. This is what it means to take off the old and to put on the new. And I've not gone into the detail of this passage, but a lot of the references that he's given here um, in this passage are references to the Old Testament. And for example, grieving the Holy Spirit is a reference to, uh, to uh, Isaiah 63, verse 10, and... Um, there we go. And other verses in there, he's linking through and he's kind of, he's, he's contrasting it to the old. Now that Jesus has come, we have this new possibility. So um, let's then look at how this ends. And this is, this is really neat because uh, he ends. Can you see that's, that's highlighted in purple there? Where else in the passage is that phrase used? Walk. To walk at the beginning that's right so these are like bookends of the passage um, we walk don't walk as the Gentiles walk and uh, do walk in love now you say what does it mean walk well actually walk is a metaphor very very used very frequently in the Old Testament for how you live it's your walk and we use that even in our in our speaking nowadays the idea you know you're walking well meaning you know you're living well and, um, and so this is an image that he's taking. And so it starts off with don't walk this way, and he ends up do walk this way. And it's a beautiful summary um, of what it means to be plugged into this power. Be imitators of God, not as out of fear, but as beloved children. In other words, you're living 
the natural, out of the natural DNA that you have, that you, because you are a new creation. You've got this new life in you. And the second motivation he gives to walk in love is just as Christ loved us, gave himself up for us, an offering, a sacrifice to God for a fragrant aroma. So often he talks about sacrifice, you know, Jesus dying is like highlighting the unpleasantness of it. But here he's highlighting the beautiful side. This is like such a beautiful thing that Jesus did for us. It is like just a sweet smell that goes up that, that Jesus did. And that's how he's describing love. And so we should, our lives should walk in love in a way that's a fragrant, beautiful smell about the way that we live. So I hope that that has made it a bit more concrete for you. That it's not just this abstract taking off and putting on and connecting, but this is concrete. These three things, don't do this, but do this because this is a way of showing love. And he's just given us some examples, but of course you could work this out in many parts of life. And so uh, I'd like to, to, to pull this all together now and just to, to summarize it um, with the phrase, as I titled this message, you can choose. And uh, there we go, you can choose. Because if you're a Christian, then you have access to plugging it in. Now, as Christians often behave badly, they can behave very badly, but the, the life of Jesus isn't flowing into them when they're doing that. That's when they're disconnected. And you still have all the old bad stuff that's there, potentially, from Adam, um, and you've got to choose whether to live a life that's plugged into Jesus or one that's not. And Paul is, Paul is not saying, oh, this has happened automatically, you're going to do this. No, he is saying to them, you have to choose to do this. You have to live out of the new. You have to put off the old and put off the, on the new. You can choose. And so we've, got, we've looked at last week's message. We looked at verses 17 to 25, which is like the basic um, ideas. And then we looked at the practical response in 25 to 5.2. So um, I'd like then to just close um, by talking about putting this into practice. And um, if you're not a Christian this morning, if you're not a follower of Jesus, then the good news is that you can become a follower. You can be connected to him without, you don't have to work, do all these good things in order to please Jesus. No, no. You can't. You can't reach the point where you're good enough for God. That You actually have to start at the bottom and say, I can't do this, God. I don't have the strength. I need your strength to live a life of love. And he will give that to you. He will give you this, um, this sweet-smelling love and take away the stench of bad stuff that you've done if you ask him to. And if you're, in, if you're interested in that, I, you can talk to me more about that. If you're not a follower of Jesus today, I'd love to talk to you. So putting into practice, and so I've got just three things here to sum up with. And this is my last slide if the, if the worship team want to come up. If you are a Christian, you are a new creation. Verse 24 says we are a new creation. But you have to actively take off the old habits. You have to practice this, do it, get into a lifestyle that does this. And this is a moment-by-moment -moment choice. You don't go on a retreat and, oh, I've switched over to, f to putting on the new on that retreat. And that's, no, you have to continue to do this moment-by-moment. -moment. There is progression, you know, there is, there is growth, but you have to continue to do this. And so I'm going to pray right now that each of us has the, um, just the experience of living out of this new in this coming week. And in, in, you know, even now as we close the meeting, we talk to one another that we have the experience of being able to live out of love. So let's pray, shall we? Jesus, we thank you that you've provided an answer to how we should live by giving us your own power and making it accessible to us. Thank you, God, that we can connect to you 
and your love can flow through us. Lord, we pray that you will help us to do this, Lord. Help each of us to experience what this is like, to learn how to do this, and to live out of love, and so transform those around us. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen.